Shalom, shalom to all of you who are watching. And we are continuing this series entitled The Faith of Jesus, Judaism. The Faith of Jesus, Judaism. Now, I need to just say this right now because obviously there are a lot of people uh, who happen to be Jewish and who are watching this series of uh, The Faith of Jesus, uh, Judaism and they feel somewhat um, disturbed by the fact that I mentioned the name Jesus. And I need to make this disclaimer, these videos are not for you, the observant Jewish person. These videos are set uh, in motion to help those Jews who are find themselves in the world of the church or within the perimeters of Messianic Jews for Jesus or they're involved in other similar uh, groups like the Nazarenes uh, or any of the different lines uh, or sisters of, of uh, Christianity. And the reason I'm saying this is because I had an email that was sent to me by someone from Mexico, I believe, who did not wish to be uh, listed on the subscription of the videos. You're always welcome that if these videos are not to your liking to basically just unlist yourself to the subscription. After all, these subscriptions are of voluntary nature and you could just sub unsubscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, so please, uh, I, I am not going to take the time after you subscribe to unsubscribe you. I think that is something you need to do and that you should do if you're not happy with the contents or you feel in disagreement. But let me just say one thing, because this gentleman in particular, which I will not mention, I will, I'm not here to, to put anyone down necessarily because of their opinions. It's, it's an opinion. But they feel that there's no reason why they should be listening to a video when they should erase the name of this person. And of course, that favorite expression that utilizes Yamak Shimon, and that his name may be erased. I want just to mention this because the Lubavitcher Rebbe at one time when he was alive had stated to his emissaries um, some years ago in reference to the name Jesus that no Jew should any longer state that or make that statement. One, because he is a Jew and you never wish to say that on a Jew even regardless of the occurrence in history. Number two, he is not a god. Um, and one of the things that we're making it clear to actually reclaim the Jewish Jesus is the fact that he is not a god. He never considers, him, considers himself a deity posted up in among the world. It was the world that made him into a deity. And um, it is for this reason we say that he is not divine. And in this video in particular, we're going to go into this issue that Jesus himself, Yahushua, if you want to use the Hebrew name, is not Yamak Shemol. And may he not have his name erased because he is a fellow Jew and he is being restored as such in the contemporary society in which we live because there's so much information about them. Now, of course, that, what I just said, may have thrown a whole bunch of other people right out the door because, well, how do you they say that? Because, because that's the fact. Had he not been a Jew, he would have caused so much trouble among us. Only a Jew can do that. So the fact that in our history, We've had many similar Jews who have stirred up the world with ideas that are not necessarily 100% kosher. Is something very unique to us Jews. But that doesn't give anyone the right to be able to say, you know what, he's not a Jew. He was a Jew. He did not happen to be the Messiah. He's definitely not God in the flesh. But he was a Jew, born of a Jewish woman born, and I would even say, of a Jewish father, although the church has changed that, and we'll look into that a little bit further as we look into his claim of messiahship and the importance of the, the lineage uh, in connection of the descendants of David. 
In this video, we're going to look at um, that Jesus is not God and he is not part of any trinity. He said it himself. And apart from what we will look at the, from the Christologic um, manipulations of the Christian scriptures that have been added from the New Testament, we are going to look at God's, uh, at Jesus' God was Judaism's God. We're going to quote Christologic passage from the Christian New Testament as further to reinforce uh, the confidence that as Jews we should have in the Judaic understanding of God. These verses belong to Christianity as in our its bedrock, as Christian interprets them. Now, the Christologic layers in the New Testament have no relevance to us Jews, but we utilize the Christian New Testament to indicate and demonstrate to those Jews within the church, within the, the movement of the Messianic movement, which they are so heavily in reliance upon these manuscripts or scriptures for the basis of their belief in Jesus to show them and demonstrate to them that their founder didn't believe what you are believing in. In other words, just completely the opposite. And to understand that we are not challenging necessarily the Christian theology here, our main subject is God. As Jesus knew him, as it's written in the New Testament, it is credible. It is an incredible, incredible, credible truth, but true even within the Christologic passages that we'll find that there is confirmation of the monotheistic God of Judaism as known by Jews. In no place did Jesus say he is God. And even in those places that may make a reverence of by some as to his unity of God or as it were his following the will of God in a, in a unity form God, Jesus says he is God in no place or part of the Trinity is he included or he includes himself or he talks about a form of a, uh, of a Trinity or any unique way of substance of God he never said he was the essence of God in any special union I mean, you may find that perhaps in some Hasidic movement where they equate the Ein Sof and the Yatzmut with the, the candidate of the Mashiach uh, in the Hasidic thought of Kabbalah, but that's a whole different uh, argument that we would have to look at. And even that, too, um, by many of the current uh, Jewish scholars, is also considered... Uh, prohibited. It wasn't stated. So we're finding that there are a lot of parallels that exist from first century Christianity to today's modern Hasidic world, in particular, I'm referring to one particular movement that has made a big deal about um, a person who some hold to be the Messiah in which he hasn't qualified either. And they're trying to force that upon the Jewish world as well. But let's pause that for a moment right now. But I don't want to get both groups together because who knows, they may unite <laughs> and decide, okay, you have A and I have B, we both agree. And, and no, that's not the case. The case is you have A and you have B, but both of them are the same. In one in what level? They both basically have accepted a person as in fact Messiah when hit or they have not proven themselves to be and the proof is in the pudding, and that is the action. So everything is still the same as when they were not here. So how then did the concept of Trinity become a basic dogma to Christianity and all these other movements? It wasn't clearly comprehended from the pages of Christianity's book, so it's, it was mandated by the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, uh, after the Common Era. Uh, and hence the three centuries that we talk about here um, became actually even uh, a form of, of a declaration by the fourth century. Jesus did not have this designation as God the Son of the Trinity. A council, a Nicaean council, where were mainly made of people who were not even Jewish, said that Jesus is God of the same substance and essence. 100% God, 100% man. So, and this is one of the things that we looked at earlier, that the passage in Numbers, 
uh, tells us that clearly, mean, clearly that God is not a man. And the very moment that, that it says in that, in that passage in Numbers that God is not a man, it automatically disqualifies Jesus from a theological point of view, from a Jewish theological point of view, they cannot be the Messiah. They cannot be God. But let, let's look a little bit further. I'm going to say a blessing over the, the, the drink I'm drinking, Baruch Atah Adonai. Elohim melech haolam shehakon nihiyan bilvaron. Okay. So hence, for three centuries, we see this designation applied to Jesus. So you have to ask yourself, if God is all-powerful, why wouldn't he and and only he be the one that saves eternally? And that's mainly the main question. Why would he need another entity to do part of his work when he could do it himself? When he can do everything. He did, after all, create the heavens and the earth. Power to do all things certainly includes saving power, saving souls, saving people who are sick. In other words, why would he need a son in that fact? Now, let's continue here, because the Son reveals the Father according to Christian concept. He is not the Father. He only brings that awareness or that acknowledgement of what, the, what God is like. And it says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, and Luke chapter 10, verse 22, No man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomever the Son will reveal him. Now let's pursue our fundamental search to find out the God of Jesus is not a Trinity God, a triune God. Now we gotta put aside for a second the Christologic or the Christology here in this passage. Here we describe his father to son relationship. The words in no way signify that Jesus is actually God. In no way. But just the opposite. At the most, we can find that there's these words are very odd and even destructive of Christianity if it's taken literally. We would have to conclude that all of the Hebrew scriptures contact with God by Abraham, by Moses, by uh, the, the prophets was not, was of not, was for no reason. If this were so, it would cut Christianity's foundation as Hebrew scriptures and would not be the word of God. And certainly this contradicts Isaiah 59 verse 21 when we read, My spirit that is upon thee and my words that which I have put in my mouth on thy mouth shall not depart out, out of thy mouth. Now Isaiah said that God's spirit and words are upon the people of Israel. Look at the context of Isaiah 59 verse 21. The Father has revealed himself to his chosen people through his scriptures, through his word. Now Jesus elsewhere contradicts his words here. For example, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 through 9, and Luke chapter 11, verse 2, he enters, in, he, he declares that we should pray directly to God. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet and pray to thy Father. Pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. There's, there is our direct contact, our Father which art in heaven. In addition, notice that Jesus says that only the Father knows him. Apparently he is not an intermediary between God and man either. If we take this verse literally, that's what it would imply. Christianity can make of these words whatever they will, but no trinity can be based upon these words. So the fact that he reveals, he's a revealer, could means something else, meaning that he assumed as part of the children of Israel, who was revealed, and since he had believed himself to be, say, the Messiah, the King of Israel, the very focus point of the expression of the whole entire body of Israel, and thus he personifies this relationship, and thus bringing the idea of the word son, not to mean God the Son, but referring to the Son of God in relationship to him as a Messiah King position over all Israel. Now we're going to look at that later on because obviously he wasn't. He did not qualify to be considered the Messiah. Actually he failed the requirements. And this has always been the traditional Jewish position. He was never anointed to be king. 
He was never set up in a rulership to be king, although we can argue one way or the other whether he had the ancestry to be in the position of taking the fallen tabernacle of David and restoring that back to where it was. But as we learn in history, that neither was he able to do. So in all essence, as a Messiah figure, he failed. And we're going to look at that a little bit further. Now, in John chapter 14, verse 6 through 7, in verse 9, in John chapter 8, verse 19, and also, you'll find this also in chapter 12, verse 45, we read the words of Jesus, No man comes unto the Father but by me. If he had known me, ye had had known my Father also. And from hence ye know him, and I have seen him, and, has seen, and he hath seen me, hath seen the Father. Now, what is this? He has seen me, whoever has seen Jesus has seen the Father. What does this mean? Needless to say, this passage is contradicted and refuted by much of, of what was presented in the previous video. It is a Christological layer in the New Testament. In other words, it was something added into his mouth. Now, in, if you want to take a look at this, we'll see John chapter 5, verse 37. And the Father, ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, Paul says, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible. No one's seen, seen God. So this claim, put in the mouth of Jesus, is a very, very um, uh, important claim. Uh, because no one has seen God. And even the one who supposedly saw, as it were, the back of God, never saw God as we know it, because no one can see God and live. Nevertheless, there is a meaning under these words that you will understand later when you understand that what he, he was evoking was more of a messianic title or being Messiah. We're going to look at that later on when we get into why Jesus does not qualify even at that level. Now, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 27, it says that they should seek the Lord. It doesn't say they should seek Jesus, though he be not far from every one of us. Interesting thing. Um, someone had sent me an email that says that, that he believed uh, that they believed in long distance relationship because God was in heaven and we here on earth. And I responded to that uh, posting and I said to the person, I don't believe in long distance relationship because you never know who you really have next to you until you're close to that person. In the same way, we know that God is as close to us and as near to us as our lips and our heart. This is what our Torah tells us. He is so close to us he is so near to us that he says near to our mouth and our heart. God is everywhere. God is in everything. He's in everyone. And that makes the whole dynamic of our relationship with God a unique one, a very exciting one, because it is that God who created us, all of us, in us, which is really the hope of this entire world it is the hope of really seeing something fantastic break loose throughout this world. And here we go into something even further. And what is it? It is something even further that we can even imagine. If you call on the Father, don't forget the Lord's Prayer. A verse from the Hebrew Scripture would be also of instruction here, naming in Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. And this conflicts obviously clear with the words of Numbers 23, 19. That God is as close to us, as near to us, as our hearts and our mouth. Isn't that incredibly great? The fact that God is so near to you and I that it's just a matter of what's in our mouth? I think so. I think it's beautiful. I think it's a, 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 an incredible thing. And it is here where we find um, the same thing. It is 
powerful statement. Let's concentrate on this search for indication of a trinity here. Let's see if we find any trinity here. Again, Jesus did not say he is the Father. Um, had he said that, it would con be completely contrary to the Christian concept of a trinity, where the Father and Jesus are separate persons in the Godhead. What Jesus reason reasonably could have meant is that he is able to convey God's will to man. Jesus, it seems, is described by John as an intercessor between God and man. And this Hellenistic logos, which we'll look at it later, the passage must be taken as figurative and not literally, for it would be to fit properly in what was Jesus's meaning. Now, in any way, looking at it as we do see Jesus, he said he is the, he is the substance of the Father. At most, we can interpret Jesus claiming that he is so attuned to God that he mirrors or reflects him in a way that people could comprehend what God was all about. John chapter 1 verse 18, no man seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is the bosom of the Father, and he hath declared him. Now I want you to notice the word there, begotten, because this word begotten you're going to find also in Psalms 2, referring to the day that David was crowned king of Israel. Today I have begotten thee, you are my son, my beloved, you are the pure one. Now, this expression of begotten Son has no reference to being Him, God the Son, but rather being in a position of being accepted as the line of David, the King of Israel, in the lineage of being the representative of all of the house of Israel and being accepted by God. And we're going to take a look at further that in fact Jesus was not begotten in this sense as to be the Messiah over Israel. As a matter of fact, we're going to find later on in another video that we're going to talk about, Jesus was not only not begotten, not, say, not assumed to be the Son over all of Israel, but even furthermore, we're going to take a look at it from the very Christian position, Christian text indicating Jesus was rejected and forsaken by God, rejected and not accepted by, let me repeat that again, he was rejected and not accepted by God, he was rejected and not accepted by the angel of the presence, the, the high priest of that time, he was rejected and not accepted by the children of Israel and by the leadership of Israel, and every single word that Gamaliel, the great Rabbi Ramban, Gamaliel stated according to the book of Acts, came into realization. All of his followers, all of his disciples were dispersed through the four corners of the world. And we're talking about the Jewish followers. We're talking about the so-called emissaries. We're talking about the apostles. They were killed at the stake by the hands of Rome. They were put to death as like animals. And the horrific stories go out, which comes to sear, sear in a very strong and powerful way the words of Gamaliel in his advice to the, 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 the priestly council there in, in, in the book of Acts, when they said, just leave them alone. And if this movement is of God, no one's going to be able to resist them. But if it's not of God, these people will be put to death and be perse persecuted and, and begins to tell them us what's going to happen to them. Like all of the other pseudo-messianic movement of its time and throughout our Jewish history, which was consistent till this present day. Now, Obviously, this was something that was already indicated, and the reason why Rab Ramban Gamaliel had this insight is the very fact that they underst he understood what was taking place in the pre precursor time of the destruction of the temple, as spoken of in the book of Daniel, which had nothing in reference to a period in which the Messiah had to come. Rather, that the Messiah Prince that was anointed 
refer to someone else completely, not even in the Jewish lineage. It was given over to, as we will see, a non-Jewish power to reign and rule over the earth for a certain period of time. And that took place, my friend. And he persecuted and, 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 and tried to kill the saints of the Most High, as indicated in the book of Daniel. He raised an image. He created a God in the flesh concept, alive and well in Christianity. So we're going to look at that a little bit later on. But John chapter 6, verse 46, to continue this thought, not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, and he has seen the Father. Here we first observe that God and the Father are interchangeable appellations here. Notice that Jesus confirms the fact that he's not the Father. He's not God. Because obviously Jesus has been seen. Next, think of the word. He who is of God has seen the Father. Again, this means Jesus is not God because God is no need to see him. God is God. And one part of the Godhead is the same in substance as the other. So therefore, they're not in complete unity in regarding this. Therefore, the part needs to not contact the another if they belong to a trinity. In other words, they don't, there's no need for contact. But they do need to contact because they're not part of each other. But it's for Christianity to express the functioning of their true concept of, the, of a triune God. One more comment is due. We are not disputing that Jesus was an inspired religious person who had seen the Father in the ways all the Hebrew prophets saw the, the Father. And all the holy ones of God have seen him and declared him. All goodly religious teachers make God known. And all devout men to attain the bosom, the very heart of God in heaven as an eternal reward. Now, this first subject we saw in the previous um, video about the only begotten Son showing that Jesus was not this. And we're going to look at that again. We're going to revisit it again in that video that we're going to talk about what makes up the Messiah Messiah and who qualifies as a Messiah and why a Messiah has to do A, B, and C. If he doesn't do A, B, and C and does not complete those basic functions then he cannot be declared or be given the name Messiah and is only a, um, a method to try to force a candidate as such, like a politician that runs for office as President so-and-so. No, he's not the president yet. Not until he gets the crown and he gets to rule and he's in the White House and he's declared such by the voters. You can't do that. And my friends, this is the politics of both Christianity and those, those that have gone out of Chabad that are now trying to push the Lubavitcher Rebbe as the Messiah. It is the marketing. It is the campaigning of a dead person that is no longer in this physical plane to push them as the Messiah. And I apologize if I offend those who feel that those who are with God are alive. And it's true. Even though they are alive, we're talking about met. We're talking about that their physical bodies are here, somewhere. Even though they may not be physically seen, they're, they pass something on. And this will become a problem, a main, main issue with the Christian concept, because if he did not rise from the dead, then, as it says by Paul, your faith is in vain. And I'm going to demonstrate from the New Testament itself indications and reference that in fact Jesus did not rise from the dead the way you have been taught. In a glorious immortal body seeing that the incorruptible took on, I mean the, the, that, the, that the, the corruptible took on incorruptibility. This is in fact the concept of Christian's idea of Jesus' resurrection. Now, we're going to look at that because it's very important to see what happened there. So I'm going to stop right here on this video because we were going to look that Jesus is God is not the Trinity. And we're going to continue with the second part of this, this video. Shalom, shalom.